we are. We might be up now. Yep. Okay. Yay. That's the end of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> I think we're here. <laughs> that was that was a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I had to hear the whole song. Yeah. So one second here. I just got to get some other stuff closed out of the way. I think we're ready to go. Okay. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Second First year. of all, hope everybody's got stuff with turkey. Um, looks like we're good to go, I think. Guys, you guys are seeing it up on both channels, okay? Uh, all right. Yeah. I'm okay. seeing it on uh, YouTube here, no problem. Awesome. We got Lisa on from New Jersey. We got Mark on from uh, Phoenix. Hey, Phoenix. welcome, Mark. Oh. Awesome. By the time I get to Phoenix, she'll be rising. She'll be sleeping. She'll be sleeping. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I hear in Winnipeg with Roseanne Kerwin and Catherine Mitchell. Nice to see you guys. Hey, thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. And hello, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach for October the 9th, uh, the Sunday night astronomy show. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I am an amateur astronomer and member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. First of all, I'd like to welcome uh, or introduce our regular co-host and fellow RAS member, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton, New Brunswick. Hello. You know, Paul. Good evening. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome back our other regular co-host and fellow RAS member, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory in beautiful St. John. <laughs> oh. PFO, Mike. From PFO. PFO. <laughs> Okay, uh, then uh, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, now we've been staring back at the universe for thousands of years. It's only been the last 400 years or so, though, that we've had the ability to distinguish more than just constellations in our night sky. Uh, telescopes have enabled us to view the deep sky objects that can never be seen otherwise, and they have also helped us understand and appreciate those celestial bodies that are closer to home and within our own solar system. And then there's the wonder that telescopes like Hubble and James Webb are bring, uh, providing to us on a regular basis. But how did we get to where we are today? Well, in tonight's discussion, Paul is going to provide us with a brief history of telescopes. Uh, also tonight, uh, along with uh, answers to uh, last week's lunar challenge, Mike has another challenge ready to go. Uh, so I'll be providing the, your uh, photos that you sent in for the lunar challenge. And also Bino Bud has promised to return with another fine binocular target of the week. He's a good fellow. He's a good fellow, yep. Yes. Um, I'll offer a quick view of what to watch for in this week's sky and also have uh, all of your wonderful photo, photo submissions to share. I have a lot of photos actually this week, uh, so we'll, I'm looking forward to getting to the, all those. Now, this is a family-friendly interactive live broadcast. So for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, uh, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions in real time as well. And of course, we'd like to welcome all of those who have been joining us regularly through the Brokul Rogers TV, TV network. Thank you for your support. Okay, so let's get started then with tonight's program and a discussion around the history of the telescope. And I want to say hello to uh, everybody out here in uh, YouTube land as well, including uh, Anthony from Delaware. Awesome. Wow. Thanks, Anthony. Wow. Great to see everybody. Great to see uh, everybody sharing uh, the program out there and, and us getting out to a wider audience. We love it. We love it. I want well, uh, makes, to makes it all worthwhile. take a quick second for a shout out to Shane and Kayla who got married today. Which is awesome. Yay. Congratulations. Hey, congratulations. congratulations. There we go. And a shout out to my brother, Danny, who tunes in every week at the same Yay. time. <laughs> hey, Dan. Okay. Um, let's go from there then to uh, Paul, uh, your Lost discussion him. on. <laughs> oh, we did. Here he is. Just kidding. Uh, I'm just looking at screens. Okay. Oh, we lost you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm here. He's there. <laughs> I think I we're all be. on. I have, to, I have to be here in the back. Hmm? We're all having a trip to fame high or low, however you look yeah. at it. Oh, you got sugar mm. and you up. Everybody's I'm, I'm good. I'm good for the night. 
And uh, I think Mike's going to get turkey. Have you got your turkey yet? Eventually. Yep. Eventually we'll get his turkey. So he will sleep eventually. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I offered him chicken instead of turkey. But the yeah. plate, you couldn't tell because there's so much gravy over the meat. You couldn't tell if it could have been oh, hammered. Yeah, I oh, <laughs> love gravy and stuff. Do you get much stuffing in a chicken? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going for the Wendy's chicken sandwich myself. So. <laughs> All okay, right. uh, let's All get right. started then with, uh, with what we got. Let me share on my screen. See if I can figure out which one it is first. Mark uh, did say I heard, I heard they are planning on giving the Hubble a boost. Let's hope so, Mark. Let's. Uh, I, I did hear that as well. That would be awesome if they do that. Anyway, okay. Okay, Off let me know if you can see my screen because I can't. I can. Yes. Can yes, and the audience can too. We're good. Okay, uh, just a sec here. I wonder if I can move this. Hang on a boat. You can see my mouse moving that thing off the screen. Um, can't see that your mouse. Yes, on. yes, I can see your mouse. Okay, good. Good. there it is. Yep. Good. Okay. All right. So let's get into this. Uh, the history of the telescope. The telescope has been around for many, 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 many years. Uh, over four hundred years. It's hard to believe. And uh, optics have ever been have been around even longer than that. So um, you know they were using optics before the before this device, these pieces of glass put together to be called a telescope was invented. So it's actually got quite a little history. So what we're gonna do tonight is we're just gonna talk um, a, a fair bit on some of the key players in the telescope uh, development back in the 1600s. And then we'll work our way up to a few, you know, some other things, but, um, but I think we'll spend most of our time in there. Uh, when I was putting this together, I didn't realize the um, amount of information and the amount of things besides what these people were going to talk about were famous for that they contributed to, and it was just it's just unbelievable. And some of the things that they went through to uh, to do what uh, what we take for granted today, it's just unbelievable. So, so the first question is now this is going out to everybody. Don't look at your computers or your or your smartphones. Uh, you know, and, and who invented the telescope? So here's your three choices. Was it Galileo Galilei? Was it Isaac Newton, which should be Sir Isaac Newton? Or was it Hans Lippershey? Who invented the telescope? I'll wait for a couple answers to come through. That's a question out to everybody else. Number three, we got the answer. And okay. Emma also says hands. Yeah. Hans. Hans and Franz. Hans and Franz. Hans and Franz. Okay. <laughs> so everybody's saying it's Hans Lippershe. Mm. All right. Well, let's see. Hey. Ta -da. Ta -da. Correct. Hans Lippershe. So here's a little history on Hans. Hans Lippershey, uh, born in 1570, buried 29 September 1619. Was he dead when they buried him? <laughs> yeah, I think he's still buried. Also known as Joanne, Johann Lippershey or Lipperhead. So anybody who talks about this gentleman, uh, sometimes you'll see the S in the name and sometimes you won't. Um, so he was a German Dutch spectacle maker. So, uh, so that's basically what his, his background was when he came up with this idea. He's commonly associated with the invention of the telescope because he was the first one who tried to obtain a patent for it. And it is, however, unclear if he was the first one to actually build a telescope. So that was kind of interesting. So he filed for a patent in 1608. So uh, Hans Lippershey is known for the earliest written record of a refracting telescope, a patent he filed in 1608. His work with optical devices grew out of his work as a spectacle maker and industry, uh, an industry that had started in Venice and Florence in the 13th century. So that's how long glass has been around and later expanded, or uh, optics I should say, and later expanded to the Netherlands and Germany. So what you're looking at there in that um, little image is Lipperhays, Lipperhays, uh, applied to the States General uh, of the Netherlands again, and that's when he applied for the patent. And his phrase 
for what he had put in there to for this patent was for seeing things far away as if they were nearby. And uh, so there's many people who say, well, there were a lot of other people that were uh, building, making spectacles as well. And what's to say they didn't have two pieces of glass and put them together and realize you can magnify with them. In fact, they think some people did uh, do that, but not for what um, he uh, was, was claimed to have done. So he's quite a cat. Um, he never did, by the way, get that patent. And the reason he didn't get the patent was because they said it was too simple a device and it was too easy to copy. So they wouldn't allow him to actually have the patent on it. So he just made a spectacle of himself. He just made a spectacle of himself. <laughs> oh, that's one of that's one of Paul's lines. Come on. Yeah, there you go. So this refractor, uh, so this telescope rather, was in fact uh, the one of the, if not the first, refractor design. And so when you look at that, when you think of a refractor, we think of some other people, which we'll get to in a moment. But basically the design of the refractor, where this all came from, was if you look at the front of the, of the telescope, the, the part that you point towards the sky, there's actually a, a, a large lens gathering and that where, that's where it comes in and it actually bends the light. Bends the light down to a focal point right here. And then you have another little eyepiece that you actually stick in the front and it's got a certain amount of magnification that goes along with it. And it kind of joins in uh, at, at a, what they call a focal point, And that's how you're able to see. So small, small lens magnifies and the focus is the light for your eyes. So that's basically how a refractor works. A really basic explanation of it, really. Now, Galileo Galilei is probably the one that most people think invented the telescope. Because... When we think of a telescope, we think of astronomy. We think of the night sky. That's what we think of when we think of a telescope. When they invented this device back in the day, uh, and, and actually it was only a year before Galileo had heard about this idea that this, this, happened, this gentleman, uh, Lippershey, had come up with. It was him that actually took the idea and went to space with it. Because Lippershey didn't actually use it for telescope. He just used it to bring things closer. And, they, and, and in fact, the magnification that they had back in when he was at it was like three times. So it was like practically not a lot of magnification at all. And uh, so what happened with Galileo Galilei, he thought uh, uh, not that the first, he wasn't the first inventor of the refracting telescope, significantly enhanced its power in 1609. So here's a year later. Uh, and he learned of the spyglass, which is what they were saying that that was used for. The people, some people were using it to see um, uh, battleships and things like that, uh, and began to experiment with telescope making, grinding, and polishing his own lenses. So his telescope allowed him to see with magnifications of eight or nine times, making it possible to see that the moon had the mountains and Jupiter had satellites. Now he went on uh, to make telescopes, and I think the most power that he came up with was 30 times. So he actually came up with a scope that we could see 30 times. Think about that for a minute when you think about what we're using on ground-based telescopes now. That's, uh, that's pretty wild. Okay, another question coming up. And don't go to your smartphone or your computer. On the Galilean moons, who can name the four Galilean moons? And I'll wait for that. Sleepy, grumpy, sneezy. <laughs> <laughs> and happy. And happy. <laughs> All right. Who are the four? What are the names of those four moons? And then I have another question right after that for all those people who did happen to look it up. They probably didn't. Uh, Emma's got have... fast fingers. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking on YouTube, so I'm not seeing the Facebook answers. Yes, yeah, so you. Uh... Emma has Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Okay. All right. So now, in what order do they follow Jupiter? In what order do they follow Jupiter? I can Jupiter? hear fingers flying now. <laughs> From <laughs> Jupiter's surface, moving out, what oh. order are those moons? Hmm. One, two, three, four, according to Sky and Telescope. 
<laughs> See, click, 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 click. One, three, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> one, three, three, four. Okay. Five, three, two, one. Okay, here it comes. So the Galilean moons outward from Jupiter are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. That is the order that they are from the surface of Jupiter. So a little bit of uh, Galilean uh, knowledge from our friend, Mr. Galileo Galilee. Now let's talk about somebody else. Let's talk about Sir Isaac Newton. Now um, he was known as a mathematician and he's done some pretty amazing things. So before I get into a lot of my little yak on it, I'll just kind of read down what we got here. So Isaac Newton is in full as Sir Isaac Newton, born December 25th, Christmas Day guy, right? 1642 in England, died March 20th, uh, or they say 31st, uh, 1727 in London. Now, English physicist, physicist and a mathematician who was the culminating figure of the science revolution in the 17th century. In optics, his discovery of the composition of white light integrated the phenomena of colors into the science of light and laid the foundation for modern physical optics. In his mechanics, or in mechanics rather, his three laws of motion, the basic principles of modern physics, resulted in the formulation of the law of the universal gravitation. In mathematics, he was the original discoverer of the inf uh, inf infinitesimal calculus, Newton's philosophy, philosophy philosophy, can I say that word? Uh, natur naturalis, principa, mathematica, this is why he's a smart guy and I'm not. Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, 1687, was one of the most important single works in history. And so that's, that's just a corner of a page of what is on this guy. Uh, this, this guy is just absolutely a genius or was a genius. Now, what was he famous for? Why are we talking about him and telescopes? Well, this is what it's all about. The Newtonian reflector, and, and thus the name Newton. Uh, so when you're looking at a Newtonian reflector, we're talking about Sir Isaac Newton, the inventor of the Newtonian reflector, which was born out of his uh, research on this white light uh, and the color bands. So the first reflecting telescope built by Sir Isaac Newton in 1668. So we're talking uh, 60 years after um, uh, uh, Hans Lipperhey, who actually was a refractor, this is a reflector, and we'll show you that in a minute. Uh, being the first known successful reflecting telescope, it was the prototype for a design that later came to be called the Newtonian telescope. There were some earlier prototypes and also modern replicas of this design. So this is actually the, the actual uh, a mock-up of what his first telescope looked like. Now, the size of it, this is kind of cool. This is the 19th century drawing of Newton's reflector. So Isaac Newton built his reflecting telescope as proof for his theory that white light is composed of a spectrum of colors. He had concluded that the lens of any refracting telescope would suffer from a dispersion light into colors, which is called chromatic aberration. The telescope he constructed uses mirrors as the objective, which bypass that problem. To create the primary mirror, Newton, Newton sorry, used a custom composition of metal consisting of six parts copper, two parts tin, and early composition of speculum metal. And this telescope, believe it or not, was, uh, if my memory is any good, was between two and three inches. That, that's how, how large the objective was. So it's not a, it wasn't a big scope to begin with. So today's Newtonians telescopes are looking a little different and a little larger than what uh, Sir Isaac Newton had, uh, had designed, but the principles are identical. The only thing that's changed is maybe how we shape the glass and the mirrors and uh, the type of materials we use, but the principles of that refracted light and, uh, and having no chromatic aberration are still intact today, which is absolutely unbelievable. There's another gentleman who actually um, was actually got famous for building a telescope. And I don't think I put him on this, this list, but I will talk about him. And it's kind of Chris's buddy. He's kind of, he's kind of the James Taylor on one of his shoulders 
and this John, John Dobson on the other one of his shoulders. And, um, and his, his name was John Dobson. And John Dobson was actually a, a monk. Uh, he was born in China or Japan. I think it was China. China. And, uh, and he uh, lived out his life in, on the streets in California. And so he took the Newtonian design telescope and he decided to make it so that he could bring it out to people so that it was easy for them to see it. And it was a much larger design at the time. In fact, John Dobson uh, actually ground his own mirrors. He built them by, by hand, his own telescopes. And he took that Newtonian telescope and he stuck it on what looks like a lazy Susan kind of a base. And that's what we're, we know as the Dobsonian telescope today. So the Dobsonian is actually a Newtonian telescope put into a base, which, uh, which was designed by John Dobson, thus the name Dobsonian telescope. So, um, so, so again, another um, telescope derived from Sir Isaac Newton's design. And on top of that, the Hubble telescope is another one. Anything that's a reflecting telescope, all this, inf all this, possibility of white light uh, prism optics came from Sir Isaac Newton. So this guy, like I said, he's this was just the tip of the iceberg of what he's done. So now we'll fast forward a little bit and we're gonna move into the world of the compound telescope. And the compound telescope just basically means that we're taking principles from both the reflector and the refractor and we're putting them together in a, in a body of a, of, a, of a, called a telescope. And, um, but there's a real advantage to this and we'll get to that in a second. So let's just talk about the history of where this one came from. So the compound telescope, or as we know it, the smith cassegrain telescope. Uh, then in 1946, an architect and artist named Roger Hayward placed a convex mirror behind the corrector lens of a Smith camera. So actually, the, there was a Smith camera before the Smith uh, telescope to send the light out of the back of a tube to an eyepiece or a camera, much like Cassegrain's earlier design. This turned a camera back into a telescope. A company called Celestron, everybody knows who Celestron is, built on this design and developed manufacturing techniques to produce what is now called the Smith Cassegrain telescope or the SCT which is what uh, a lot of us have now. In large, and they were, of course, when it got into Celestron's uh, pause, of course, it went into large quantities, uh, mass production. This revolutionized, 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 that's all right, amateur astronomy in the 70s because stargazers could now purchase relatively large aperture but compact telescopes as a, at a reasonable price. So the reason I put the design up here, I just want you to just to get it, get your head around this for a minute. When you look at a, a, a Smith Cassegrain telescope, they appear to be short. In most cases, anywhere from say a foot to maybe 18 inches long, so somewhere there in between. Uh, but yet they're claiming they've got focal lengths of 2,000, 2,500, even up to 3,000 millimeters. And the reason that they do and how that what the whole uh, crux of this design is is they've taken the lens part of the refractor to help correct some of the light. And as it goes through, it goes back to the mirror, which is the reflector, the Sir Isaac Newton portion. And that bounces back up to a secondary mirror, which is that little small mirror here, which again, is an, a, again this is where the reflector part of it comes. In fact, the smith cassegrain is a reflector telescope with a corrector lens is really what it is. And then it takes that same light and it bounces it all the way down through that little tube and to where your eyepiece or your camera might be. So because that light bends three times, that's where you're actually able to take a 20 or 2000 uh, millimeter telescope and put it in such a small body because it's actually, it's, re, it's just pushing that light around and, uh, and shortening um, the housing of the light, but the light path is still, uh, is still that long. So, so that's how, a, how a, a, a compound telescope works or SCT. And that's kind of where they came into place. And I remember seeing um, Leonard Nimoy, uh, you people know him as uh, Mr. Spock, uh, in some of the Celestron ads. And he had one of the original orange tubes, which is one of the ones Mike has on his collection. And, um, and that's what he was in a lot of the astronomy magazines. Leonard Nimoy was putting that, uh, backing it. Fast forward a few years, and then um, 
Uh, Hawkins uh, was actually uh, had a, a Smith Cassegrain uh, by Celestron in his arsenal as well. So, so this this is becoming probably the most popular telescope out there. So the Smith Cassegrain, which is the SCT in astrophotography? Question <laughs> mark. Probably the most popular telescope design is the Smith Cassegrain telescope. The SCT is a versatile design, good for both imaging and visual observation. By the way, so are the refractors and the reflectors. Uh, and is compact for portability and ease of use and is relatively inexpensive compared to other systems. So it's really, a, it's a smart design. Um, you don't have to be on a complicated mount like this. You can buy um, a typical alt as mount, which are what a lot of people have, so. So there are many types of telescopes. For Earth-based telescopes, of course, there's the Dobsonian <coughs> we talked about. So it's the Newtonian on that, let's just call it the Lazy Susan. So you can put your scope up and down or side to side. Uh, then we've got refractors. Um, we've got this little Crest Star, which is like a, a Mac kind of a telescope. Uh, there are Rasses, there are Richie Cretchens, uh, there are Hall Kirkhams. There's all kinds of different types of telescopes that are Earth-based telescopes. Having said all of that, there are also some very cool space-based telescopes that are out there now. In fact, there are 10 different types of observatories that are out there taking images and that we are enjoying today. So, um, but the technology has gotten a little different where now we're looking at different wavelengths because for all of those years that Lipperhey and Newton uh, and um, the beginning of the um, uh, smith cassegrain telescopes, we were all still looking at broadband color. We were looking at that white light with spectral, spectral colors in it. But now we have telescopes that are infrared. We have, uh, it's just, it's just well, in fact, the James, Space, the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. So it's looking at things quite differently. And as you can see the results between what um, the Hubble telescope and what the James Webb telescope is doing are very, the results are absolutely unbelievable different. Um, both very good telescopes, but the James Webb's letting us see things we had never seen before in far greater detail than we had ever seen before. And that's going beyond with a, a regular uh, red, green, blue uh, color spectrum that we as humans see. So putting it all together, what do all of these telescopes want you to do? Keep your scopes pointed up. That's what these <laughs> want you to do. And that's my little chat on uh, the history of the telescope. That's awesome, Paul. A lot of information on there. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And that's only the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I could go into that much information on each one of those guys uh, individually. Oh, could be a whole, you could be a whole week talking. We could, we could stay alive for a week if you want. But <laughs> I don't like take, uh, take you out bathroom break, but, you know, come back. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's yeah. awesome. There's a lot of information on there. Um, and, yeah, it's it's amazing that these guys got this in their head to actually go ahead and, and build something like this. We're, we're, yeah. uh, we're, very, we're very thankful on Thanksgiving Day today that, uh, that they did do that. <laughs> we are. We are with, here with our show. and. Here's yeah, opportunities. We, uh, we have this uh, telescope snobbery as well. And uh, when you start to think about what they use back then, even the cheapest stuff that we want to beat up with a baseball bat is better than what they had back in those okay. days. And look what they were able to see and discover. Absolutely. So, uh, you yeah. know, whatever you have in your house, if you have a telescope, doesn't matter what it is, you can see something when you yeah. consider what they were looking through and the things that we are going on 400 years later on what they found in those optics. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for the James Taylor mention and the, and the John Dobson. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, James Taylor, John Dobson. There you go. John Dobson. Got the James Taylor hat. We got to get you a Dobson hat. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get him a little lazy Susan on, on a hat. Yeah, yeah one, of, one of those hats with two peaks and just turn it around <laughs> to whichever suits. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go from there then. Uh, to uh, let's go with Bino Bud. How's that? There we go. Ready for Bino Bud? Ah, Bino Bud. Bino Bud. I think this is it. Tell me if we got one. We do. All right. Binocular target of the week this week by Bino Bud is dum -da -da -da, the double cluster. 
Hey. Hey. <laughs> hey. NG, speaking of Star Trek guys, right? NGC yeah. 869 and NGC 884. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the double cluster, also known as Caldwell 14, consists of open clusters. And again, NGC 869 and NGC 884, which are close together in the constellation of Perseus, both visible with naked eye in dark sky. NGC 869 and NGC 884 lie at a distance of 7,500 light years. There are quite a ways out there, but what a sight to see. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. how do you find it in the sky? Don't, I, I didn't change my slide. Uh, this is 35 degrees north, northeast. I would tell you right about now is walk outside and look virtually st <laughs> almost straight up. Mm -hmm. uh, at midnight, it might be straight up, but you look and find that W of Cassiopeia. And you come down and look over to where Perseus is, and it's right in between the two. It splits it almost dead center, and what a wonderful sight it is to see, naked eye. And then you put a pair of binoculars on it. Mm -hmm. So, again, you look at Cassiopeia, you look at the W, you can follow that V line, and it takes you right to it, right? And here's just another way to look at it with Cassiopeia if you're in this direction, depending on how it's oriented in your sky. But you follow that line from Nubi through Rekba and straight down, and you'll hit the double cluster. You'll know it when you're on it. What do you see? Basically, this is it. Look at all the stars in the background and then these two beautiful clumps put right together. It's a, it's a phenomenal sight and a great sight. In fact, in a telescope, I don't think you can get the whole cluster, both clusters in. So you need a pair of binoculars to view this one properly. 10 by 50s, this is what you got. It's a beautiful sight. And it's just amazing to look at. It never gets old, one of those things. Mm -hmm. Compared to the full moon, oh, it's probably at least two full moons, if not three full moons in size. So it's a good size object, easy to find, great to look at. And uh, what can I say? You get outside, have a peek. Mm -hmm. And this is what you start with on your first telescope. And three weeks <laughs> later, <laughs> after That's all? on Amazon. <laughs> That's binocular target of the week by Bino Bud. Awesome, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Right, that is a great target for sure. <laughs> that 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 one is always it's a circumpolar too, right? So it's it's yes. up all year long. So you've always got an opportunity to catch it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful in binoculars. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. It's just like the Pleiades. I, I find like it's as nice as the Pleiades. I'm probably even nicer because you can get a lot more of it in the view. But thanks for that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, I got to take a second here and get my, uh, Time's up. My, yep. My, my display ready to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to share, Hi. share, I'm going to do a WhatsApp talk maybe then now, uh, let's make sure my screen. I think it's going to be this one. There we go. Got the right one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so what's up this week? Let's take a quick peek. Um, so, uh, first of all, all week long, Mercury is at its best viewing. Uh, now, yesterday, a little Mercury reached what is known as its greatest uh, western elongation, which means it's the farthest west that it appears in our sky. Now, it's also at its greatest distance away from the sun. So uh, that in in uh, so that places uh, that places it in prime viewing for us in our early morning skies. Now, with an orbit of only 88 days, Mercury never strays too far from the sun. And the morning ecliptic makes a very steep angle with the horizon right now. Uh, so it's also at its highest. So this uh, is the best time really to view it this month. So get out and see if you can find Mercury. It's not going to be as bright as Jupiter, but it'll still stand out. Now, uh, red spot opportunities. Uh, since Jupiter had passed the opposition a little while ago, we were still talking about Jupiter. So this week presents several great opportunities to view the great red spot on Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter's great red spot. One second, I just got to check on my YouTube. Uh, okay, we're good. Uh, Jupiter's great red spot is a persistent high pressure region in the atmosphere of Jupiter, producing an anticyclonic storm that is the largest in the solar system. So it rotates counterclockwise. Um, the great red spot will be visible near the middle of Jupiter at these times, tomorrow night at 2318, Tuesday evening at uh, 1909, Wednesday at 2456, which would be Thursday morning, and Thursday evening at 2047. Now, all these times are at... Uh, or Atlantic uh, Daylight Time for the next little while, Atlantic Daylight. Um, okay, from there, we're going to go to ISS, Visible Passes, this week. We've got a, a couple of nice passes this week, uh, one on October the 11th, 
uh, which would be Tuesday night, I guess. Uh, we've got a brightness of a magnitude minus 3.3, which means it's going to be about as bright as Jupiter is. Um, it's uh, rising at uh, 641. Its highest point is 644, almost overhead, 61 degrees up, and then uh, finishes at 647. So we've got about six minutes. So it passed right across the top of us in the sky. Another nice pass on the 16th of October. Uh, which would be next Sunday at minus 3.6. There are other passes this week, but these are the two brightest ones I highlight. This one's actually at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so you might want to catch this one <laughs> on the 11th. Um, and um, there's there was one tonight as, as well. So to find these, I go to uh, uh, Heavens Above. So heavens-above.com. And up at the top right-hand corner, you can plug in your location. It'll ask you for where you are, and uh, and then you just click ISS from there, and it'll bring up this little chart. And if it could click on each one of these, it would actually give you a, a sky chart and shows you the path of the ISS passing over us. So not only can you find the ISS, you can do the Starlink satellites there, but uh, what's coming up is this. Uh, this is brand new on, on Heavens Above website. It's a new table that they've come out with, which really features uh, something called the Blue Walker 3. Now, they haven't put the values yet because we haven't seen it open up its petals, I'll say, yet. But there is a brand new object added to the list visible from Earth, Blue Walker 3. This satellite is the first being designed to provide 4G cellular access from space. So right to your phone. At the moment, the satellite is going through testing in orbit, but probably within the next week or so, it will begin to unfurl its massive antenna array. It's some 65 square meters in size. Now, it's difficult to say how bright this will be, but expectations are that it will be at least as bright as the ISS, if not brighter. Problem is, uh, expect about 100 of these satellites in orbit before the project is complete. So you're going to see 100 bright dots going across the sky in different times. Now, AT&T looks like it's already signed on as a partner. The website heavens-above.com has now listed it as an object to watch. So we, I'll be watching for this over the next week and we'll see what these times fill in as. Uh, there's really no uh, really no high altitudes here uh, to begin with, but this is this the first of, of uh, up to 100 of them. So more, more things to look at in the sky, good or bad. Um, tonight, of course, we've got the full hunter's moon. Uh, full hunter's moon is in our evening sky. Moonrise took place at 659. Uh, Atlantic Daylight Time and each successive moon rise this week will take place only about 20 minutes later than the last one. That's because the ecliptic or that path that the planets and the moon make across the sky, it makes a very shallow angle with respect to the horizon uh, in the evening at uh, around this time. Um, so if you didn't catch the moon rise tonight, try again tomorrow night right around the same time, about 20 minutes later. And it should stay in that uh, because it's rising um, not quite vertically. Um, it'll stay down in the thicker part of the atmosphere longer. So it should stay uh, that orange, nice orangey color for a little bit longer. Now, on Monday night, uh, we've got Europa and Io. Here's an opportunity to catch uh, a couple of moons. Europa is uh, uh, like coming out from the shadow of, of uh, Jupiter. On Monday evening, you'll be able to spot two of the Jupiter's Galilean moons, Europa and Io, as they emerge from Jupiter's shadow. Europa appears first at 731, and then Io appears at 843. So, so of course, Jupiter casts this long shadow out into space, and the moons get in behind there. They, they get eclipsed by Jupiter, and all of a sudden, you'll be looking at Jupiter, and all of a sudden, you'll see this pop, this thing pop out way in the middle of here, or out here somewhere. It's uh, pretty neat to watch. You say, well, what's that all of a sudden? Then you find out it was one of the moons. Now, on uh, Thursday night, uh, the moon is in Taurus. Uh, Thursday evening should provide one of the best views of the week uh, as our gibbous moon and Mars travel together uh, with the constellation Taurus across the night sky. Now, Taurus is also the home of the beautiful Pleiades cluster, as well as the reddish Aldebaran, which is this big bright red star here. Compare the colors between Mars and Aldebaran and see which one's brighter as well. That's a nice little uh, test to try. And all of these, of course, are followed soon by Orion right up uh, after that. So we're getting into our winter time, but there's a nice line up there. We have the Pleiades. Uh, the moon, Aldebaran, and Mars all together. And of course, the Orion Nebula down in here as well. So our skies are still pretty this time of year. Uh, Friday night, uh, moon and Mars together. Now on Friday evening, watch for our waning gibbous moon as it greets and past the full moon now. <clears throat> so it's getting smaller. Uh, we'll watch it as, the, as it greets the red planet Mars. Now Mars has not reached uh, its best viewing for the year yet. 
Mars won't reach opposition. In other words, the Sun, Earth, and Mars are all lined up until December the 8th. But uh, viewing uh, it now should reveal some of its interesting features as we get closer to it. Uh, December 8th is going to be a special date, too. We'll talk about that uh, on that later um, What's Up talk. Now, Saturday, uh, October 13th, uh, our RASC, which is the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the New Brunswick chapter, which is what we're members of, uh, actually celebrates their uh, AGM, or uh, Annual General Meeting. Now, in the morning session, there is a business meeting, which we talk about uh, the, the business of the, of the society and how things are happening. But in the afternoon, there are sessions that are going to be opened up uh, for talks. So we have one here for responsible lighting, uh, for a healthy, safe, and secure environment put on by Bob King. Then light pollution at the RASC as well. We talk about light pollution. Then we'll have a break, a little bit of a recognition award presentation, some door prizes, and uh, astrophysiology and astronomy education high school, and then closing remarks. So that's going to start at 1 p.m., um, I'll put a link up later in the week, probably on Friday for it's a Zoom, it's actually a Zoom meeting. So I'll put the link up for that and um, everybody can join. You're more than welcome to join us. Uh, Sunday, next Sunday, October the 16th, uh, Io in a shadow. So we've got uh, Jupiter's small moon Io will transit across the face of Jupiter, followed by its shadow. Now, these events are fascinating to witness and, and photograph as well. It's, it is difficult to capture Io when it's in front of Jupiter. Uh, but it is visible once it passes the face of the planet. Now, shadow, though, is visible the whole time it traverses across the planet. It takes quite a while, too, from 2238 to 2451. So uh, almost, uh, I guess, a little over two hours. Uh, the transit of its shadow takes place from 2309 to 123 a.m. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Those are happening quite a bit. We usually get a lot of those uh, happening as well. So. And uh, I'd like to go back to Lisa's Look Up Astronomy More. Lisa's on here with us tonight. Uh, Lisa has a fantastic page. It's called Lisa's Look Up Astronomy More. I recommend that you follow her at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Here's her October chart. Uh, you can click on that and save it for yourself as well. Um, so she lists all of the uh, special events for the month. Then we have uh, the dates of the events, uh, the peak times, and uh, seeing tools. Now, she did mention, too, here a uh, meteor shower on the 10th. Uh, south toward north towards so we'll keep an eye out for that i'll put a post up about that one i forgot about that meteor shower coming up on the 10th so i'll put a post up about that uh, probably tomorrow night but she covers all the all the uh, all the special things that are happening and our, our local calendar this is our saint john astronomy club slash rask uh, new brunswick um calendar for the month of october november so if you wanted to get a look at this you can go to the saint john astronomy club page or the rask nb page and download the calendar yourself. It gives us all the special events that are happening from now till the uh, middle of November, including a lunar eclipse. So let's watch for this one. Don't forget on November the 8th, the morning of the 8th, the lunar eclipse uh, will happen. Total lunar eclipse from our point of the country. And uh, that's gonna be all that we've got for this week to look at. And uh, we'll put another post up again about, uh, <laughs> about the meteor shower coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah drive your cats crazy yeah no, indeed. <laughs> okay <laughs> that's what they say is that um so let me close that and uh i guess we're gonna go next to uh lunar challenge lunar challenge lunar challenge yeah Let's see if i can find the right screen here okay uh, this one Let's see if that works sure well, we should see nothing yet. Oh, here it comes. Yep, there it is. All right. Binocular Moon Crater Challenge. So last week, we did what was called Eudexus. And I said I would wait and I'd, this week, and I'll show you where it is on the moon. If you look here to follow the Apennine Mountain Range, it comes right up. And the first big crater that you see, if you follow it up, is going to be Eudexus. Now, we had some people actually take some photos of Eudexus from what I hear, right, Chris? That's right. You want to show them when I finish this one, or do you want to sure. show them? Sure. All right. I can, I can show them when you're done here. Okay. So there is where Eudexus is. And we'll show you the photographs that people took. And I'm impressed that people went out and, and uh, did the Lunar Challenge and, and uh, talk, took pictures of it. Absolutely. So this week, we have Aristoteles. So Aristoteles is a diameter, approximately 87 kilometers, and a depth of approximately, but 
Paul's pictures in the way here. 3.3 kilometers. <laughs> it's in the corner of my screen where our video is showing. So oh. Aristoteles is a complex crater with terraces, uh, but in the place of a central mountain peak, it has a couple of small off-center peaks that are poking through the lava plain on its floor. A uh, substantial ejecta blanket to the north of Aristoteles clearly shows radial structure. And if you catch it uh, around sunset, it would uh, show like many points of light peeking through the shadows. So here is a picture of Aristoteles. And you can see the terraces down the side and the, the little peaks in the center. And that's going to be our target is to go out and find Aristoteles. And if you take a picture of it, like uh, some people did on the last challenge, great. I'd love to see them. And uh, this is what I want you to find. And that's our binocular challenge this week, Aristoteles. Awesome. Great. great. Thanks, Mike. Well, um, I think we, we had a prize that we're going to give away. Um, but either we're going to, well, I'll, leave, I'll let Paul decide. Either we're going to give it tonight or we're going to wait for a couple of weeks <laughs> and get some entries matter. together. So if you do want to do it, here it is. Oh, just a second. There it is. There it is. There it isn't. So the binocular <laughs> and naked eye guide to the stars. And awesome. I, I don't know if you can see the pages, if it'll disappear on us or not. But it's really a book all designed uh, on helping you find stuff with the naked eye mm -hmm. or with a pair of binoculars, pair of binoculars first and, and, and or the naked eye. But it's a really, really, it's a thick book. It's an easy carry. It's all bound. And, uh, and uh, just for the red light, you can see all of this stuff. And it has so much stuff in it, it's unbelievable. So that is what uh, the book that we'll give away. Okay, nice what, okay why, don't we, uh, why don't we collect, why don't we do it for this month's challenge? How's that? For the month okay. of October, okay? Because we got five or six entries and whoever submits a new entry gets another entry. So if you submit uh, one for Mike's uh, Lunar Challenge for tonight, even those who have already submitted entries, we're going to add you for another another uh, entry into the contest. So we'll give that away at the end. And I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna add a prize to it too, uh, for the end of the month. So we'll make it a little bit more tantalizing. Okay, I love let's prizes. Have, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so let's look at what we got. Um, so let me get my notes out here. Get my notes out. And there's okay. So here's what we see. Oh, I gotta share my screen, don't I? Well, I better open the picture first. Hang on. Okay, now I can share my screen, I think. Uh, one second. One more second. I just got to get... <laughs> next slide. Uh, next slide, yeah. <laughs> I got to bring this one over here. There's my notes and there's my picture. Okay, now I can share. Um, so first up, we have uh, Robert. Robert Cadet. Yes, sir. Look at that. There it is. Here it is. You got awesome it. capture, Robert. I love it. Good stuff. Very nice. Um, next up, we got Alan Burgess. He says, uh, good evening, Mike, Chris, and Paul. Here's my attempt at this week's Lunar Challenge. Um, I enjoyed it. He said, I got I got a chance to dig out my little grab-and-go scope, a Celestron Star Sense Explorer DX130. Um, I had a little hard time setting up my next YZ phone mount with my iPhone uh, 11 Pro. So, But he got it. Nice. He awesome. Got it. Here we yeah, go. That's excellent. Good stuff, yep. Alan. Uh, next up, we got Joey Craswell. So uh, here's yes, a photo sir. of Alexa, Eudoxus as well. Very awesome, nice, Joey. Scott. Well done. And follow up that with one from Lisa Ann Fanning. The Lisa says, patience was a virtue after five days of rain in New Jersey, she said. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Uh, we got a small window of clear skies Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. So I sprang from my bread to do uh, and, and to seize the opportunity as days. Dave Chapman always reminds me astronomers observe when they must and sleep when they can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> very, very oh, that's true. Well done. So I love uh, it. hope your skies are clear, she says. So good stuff. Excellent. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, we're going to go on now to uh, Bridget. Is this Bridget? Yeah, Bridget Green. Uh, yeah. She says, Hi, Chris. She says, I think I have a, a Eudoxus showing in this photo. Uh, I okay. believe it's a smaller crater under Aristoteles. Oh, <laughs> yeah, name right it. There. That's yeah. perfect. <laughs> Here's your hint for next week. <laughs> we'll just appearing uh, close the below. Pictures, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now appearing close to below it and a bit to the left, he says uh, they are in the northern area close. To, this is, this one will be visible, yeah, because it's third quarter. It won't be yep. third quarter yet. Uh, they are in the northern area close to the tip. Hope this makes sense. Uh, if I knew how to insert an arrow pointing 
<laughs> do it on photo. I would. That's okay, Richard. You got it. You got you it. Described, you described it very well. So yes, sir. Very nice. And we're gonna go thank to, you for going out and capturing it. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we got Paul Crowder from the UK here as well. Uh, yes, just hired, hired, Look at Chris. that. Right at the end of the oh, episode. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul's, uh, Paul's on here with us tonight. Uh, Paul says, hello, Chris, and uh, hello from the UK. Have not uh, had the opportunity to observe the moon recently yet, but I would like to submit a couple of images I captured a while ago of Mike's lunar target. I've also included a, a photo of my lunar observing Bible f uh, for, for my Celestron 8 uh se telescope have a look at that so there's the crater again yes sir awesome and uh the crater is coordinates of 44.3 degrees north 16.3 degrees east exodus uh was an ancient uh greek astronomer mathematician and a scholar of plato or eudoxus i should say yeah. Yeah. not exodus and uh there's his other shot yep yeah, there should be well done awesome. this is the book this is the book he uses the hatfield set lunar atlas Perfect. Good. We got to look up that one. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, well Paul. In clear skies, he says, and clear skies to you as well. So thanks for those. Okay. So what we'll do is then we'll is we'll hold on to these uh, these images. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks everybody. That's that's yeah. awesome. That's, well done. that's really good. Really good. And and okay. just ignore the hint for next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Let's go to. Uh, we're getting, uh, yeah, we've got about five minutes left before the hour is up, but we are usually a little bit longer. So I'm probably going to be a few minutes longer because I've got a lot of photos here tonight to share. A lot of people have been contributing. I really appreciate, uh, we really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to show them off. So let's get to our photos then for tonight. Um, I need to find my list again. Bear with me. I can only open so many windows at a time on my desktop. So uh, I'm going to do. This one for photos, bring them over here. And uh, down to just four screens now too, so. <laughs> Aw. Aw, I know. <laughs> well, it, it seems to run a little bit easier. Um, okay, and I just gotta get my notes going right here. Okay. All right, let me, I think I'm ready. I'm just gonna... Bear with me. Open up the first photo. Okay. Okay, now I'll share my screen. Should be this one. Okay. Now, are you guys see my menu on the bottom here, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, hang on a second. Okay, let's get this over here. I guess that's okay. Um, stop sharing again for one second. Try let's try this again so we can get a better screen. Well, same thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> this one. There. What's that look like? Yep. Good. That's good. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, this one came in from Raymond Kwong. Uh, he said it's a wide field Saturn region and the Crescent Nebula together in Messier 29, which is in here. You see, able to see those okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, Raymond, for those. Lots of detail there. Wow. Yeah. Look at the stars. Is, uh, yeah, M29 star and the butterfly nebula right below star. In the butterfly nebula, yes. Yeah, really nice. Awesome, thank you for those. Okay, uh, we're going to go from there to Carol Bean, who sent us this one of the uh, Gibbous Moon. Very nice. And uh, we're going to go from there to thanks, Carol. Carol's photo is still the cover page of, on the, on our main page there as well. Um, David Smart, I didn't get these. David, uh, I apologize for not getting them last week. My email addresses get mixed up a little bit sometimes. So uh, this is one that he captured uh, of Saturn back nice. on the 30th. So the well condition done. of the transparency was not that good. And the cloud came again in, uh, clouds came in again, he says, uh, six inch SCT and used a ZWO 462 camera. So well done. Nice, nice shot. Yeah. yeah. And he's got this one of uh, Jupiter as well. Yep. 
Yes, sir. Awesome stuff, well, Dave. Dave. has really come a long way, hasn't he? Mm, yep. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And his third shot with some sunspots. There you go. Uh, now you're cooking with propane. Take him with a 60, <laughs> 60 millimeter solar scope. Unreal. <laughs> that little Beautiful. 60 millimeter does some, get some nice stuff. Yeah. Nice and sharp. Mm. Okay. Um, a little bit farther now, we're going to go. Oh, should uh, the picture was taken uh, with a 60 millimeter solar scope on Ioptron mount uh, ZWO 462 MC was a camera. Um, Oh, I guess that's about all. Okay. You should start. You're still learning. I think you're doing okay. Don't you worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll get these from Kathy Adams. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. I'm just, hang on, guys. Just making sure that we're still popping up on uh, Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah. All right. Give me a second. We can go back to it then. Okay. Uh, she says, hi, Chris. Uh, we had a couple of nights of relatively clear skies, and I was able to capture a few images, hoping for lots more nice nights. So, uh, there's another beautiful shot of Jupiter. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Love she's that red spot. Doing some awesome work. And uh, thank you for those. I, I might have missed one. I have to check back. I might, might, I might have had them. Anyway, let's go. <laughs> Stefan Picard sent this, uh, this one in right here. Um, here are a couple of captures for the past week. Guess what? Um, Double cluster. Yeah. Yeah. There we are. Double <laughs> cluster and Perseus. Nice capture. Nice final target. <laughs> yeah. He said he's been wanting well to shoot this one. So very well done. Did he say, did he give any details? Uh, no. So no? Just okay. did a double cluster in Perseus, NGC 869 and 884. Oh, yes, they did. I'm sorry. Hang on. So I'm waiting to shoot for a while. Uh, it is uh, 60 exposures of 10 seconds each at 300 millimeter F5.6 and ISO 3200, all stacked with 20 darks and 20 flats. Processed in Photoshop and Lightroom. If you look closely, I added a very discrete star diffraction spikes uh, yeah. to the brightest blue stars. There are as there are many as there are. Sorry, there are many as there is blue shift, and they are coming towards us at 22 kilometers per second and 21 kilometers per second, respectively. Yes, sir. So, here we go. Very nice. Very nice. Thanks, Stefan. And this is uh, Kathy's picture. That was his third picture there of the moon. Yes, nice there. Yeah. And there's Eudoxus. <laughs> Eudoxus. <laughs> yeah, there it is. She just she could have circled it and sent it in. And, oh, pretty. Uh, there's another one of Kathy's, yeah. Very pretty. Very yeah. nice. And this is uh, his other picture, uh, Stefan's. Moon and Jupiter? Yeah. Uh, said the first one is the, yes, the, this is from last night with Jupiter near the moon. Yes, sir. There it was, yeah. It was, it, was, it was pretty close. Yeah, and it was. It was. Uh, Jupiter rose tonight before the moon. Uh, it was a little bit farther away, but uh, still nice to see both of them come up together. I said, even though it is the largest of the planets and the closest it has been in almost 60 years, it still looks so small once you take the glare or the brightness away, for sure. No, yeah. 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 It shows you the difference, too, between the size of what you mm. can see in a telescope. Because mm. a lot of people will go out there and think, oh, I'm going to get a picture of Jupiter. It's the biggest thing on the... And then they don't realize how tiny it is. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Vacation, you need to actually be able to get it. To get some detail, for sure, yeah. Um, okay, let's keep going. And, uh, oh, these ones are from... Oh, so these beautiful. are from, uh, it's from Brad Perry. So Brad says, hi, Chris, I have two photos to share with you this week. Uh, one is of the Aurora on Sunday, October 2nd, <laughs> around 11.30, uh, looking, across, looking across Shogamok. Shogamok Cove near Nakawick. Well done. Nice. Oh, cool. Yeah. He does get some of reflection. Have that kind of horizon to look mm. at that, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the reflection in the water eh, of the. Aurora. Oh, everything. Yeah, yeah. the picture is amazing. Yeah. Great stuff. Good stuff, Brad. And uh, he sent this one in uh, of the almost full moon taken last night uh, from Belmont Provincial Park in PEI. Gorgeous. Nice, nicely yeah. done. Yeah. Well done. Now, um, I had put up a, a live video of the moon last night. Oh, and, look at uh, that. And some people sent me in some photos uh, or oh, nice, at nice. attached the photos to my live feed. So this is this is what I got later on. So, yeah, there's this one's from Jim Waters, St. John's Skyline with the moon. Yeah, it's just popping nice. right up. That's fantastic. Perfect, perfect nice location. Yeah. yeah, well framed. Uh, from there, we've got uh, Barb Koch right uh, here from... Uh, 
Fredrickson. Oh, nice. Barb Rafe. Nice shot. Looks like it's uh, uh, pinned at pinned to the yeah, table. it does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Single Christmas ball. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Yeah. <laughs> well, from there, we go to Ed Butler's a shot from Hampton. Nice. <laughs> Excuse me. And the Moon and Jupiter together. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and then we're going to go to Denise Gauthier. Her Moon and Jupiter capture. Oh, that's cool. Denise. I like the glow from the street light. That's neat. Mm. And there's a second one of hers as well. Right on. Yes, sir. Nice time. Uh, Lisa's look up, astronomy and more. Lisa Fanning here sent this one in, moon rising over the ocean. Well done. Nice. Yes. The color. Thanks, guys. Mm. And we got Michael Powers capture here, moon and Jupiter again. Nice. And uh, Charlotte, oh. and Charlotte and Pete Dupuy here. There you go. Nice big moon. Yes, sir. Great moonshots. And Robin Sanders. Where's that? Redhead or something? Now he didn't say where it was, but it looks like uh, I was going to say I was going to say Milford, but maybe not. I don't know about waterway. It's a nice shot, anyway. It is nice, yeah, yeah. Now we're going to go move there to uh, Jamie. Why not? Jamie's on here. Uh, she's like, oh. "Hi, Chris. I took the photos of the, I took the photos of the moon Monday evening. The first was of uh, the sixty-two percent waxing gibbous moon." And uh, the second is the uh, Mare Imbrium region of the moon. Very nice, nicely done. Beautiful shot. Yeah, wow. Nice detail. Yeah. Now, third uh, up, she says, uh, the third photo is from last night's public outreach in my town's park. Excellent. Nice. Oh, awesome. There we go. Hey, eh? so there we go. So sure. myself and, and local astronomer Wayne Mansfield set up our daubs and his big binos for the views of the moon, Jupiter and Saturn. Now, we were clouded out last Saturday night but had great skies last night and offered views to 16 people. Ages ranged from four to 70 years old. Wow. <laughs> awesome. So there you go, Jamie. Welcome to the uh, wonderful world of outreach. And yep. uh, you're Beautiful. hooked now. <laughs> there goes all your free time. You're on the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's awesome that you're out doing that. And uh, good for you and good for all those people who had an opportunity to look through your equipment. That's the main that's thing. Fantastic. Yeah. See stuff that they'd never had a chance to see before. Well done. I'm going to go from there to Rob Fanning's uh, shot. Uh, this photo of the sunset in Cape May, New Jersey last evening. He said, wow. I thought you might enjoy it. So, that's yeah, beautiful. that's beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. Nice. And from there, we're moving to Duckman Arsenal. Great moon for Thanksgiving weekend, he said. There it is with, it is. with Jupiter. Yes, October colors. <laughs> Let's get another big shot of it here. Beautiful. Nice shot. Well done. And this third one here from tonight. Oh, that's cool. I yeah. love the reflection oh, behind the clouds. Yeah, yeah. it's really well, uh, good. Yeah. Good stuff, Doc. Thank you for those. Uh, Kimmy Williams sent these from a friend in Amsterdam tonight. Oh, wow. Oh, look at that now. That's cool. That is. And uh, here's your second shot. Oh, excellent. Well done. And uh, she said, This is the moon from East St. John tonight. She captured. Oh, the other, I guess tonight. last wow. night. Last night, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Last night. Okay. Yeah. Um, from there, we're going to go to Danny Swan's picture from the moonrise at Nicktow Lake in Mount Carlton Park. Beautiful. Oh, that's, you know where that is. That's right at, oh, you guys weren't there, but that's the new lodge. That's new the lodge, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 When, we, when, I, when I shot that Milky Way shot, I was exactly across the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was beautiful. beautiful. Love that spot. Love that place. Oh, it's just amazing up that's there. That's Dis Disneyland, yeah. Yeah. And this one from Mark Sonier uh, this evening, the moon tonight. Beautiful. Nice. Very nice. Thank Reflection. you, everybody. Gorgeous reflection. Yeah. Wonderful stuff. And so if you want to send in your photos, we love getting them here. Send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com or send them into SNAS, S-N-A-S for Sunday Night Astronomy Show, at astronomybythebay.ca. That's a nice shot, too. And that's a nice shot too yeah yeah we gotta give no, it jupiter and, and, and beautiful <laughs> yeah, really, and, and the wow. dobsonian sitting there on the moon wow. that's right i'm doing some outreach <laughs> looks like behind me it looks like the uh orion or the uh um uh, the rosette yeah it does and my coffee nice hot coffee you guys, nice hot mike's the only one with the mike's coffee, coffee yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that happened this time anyway, okay <laughs> All right, Mel, that's awesome. Uh, thank you for everybody for all those. They were they were awesome to, to view and awesome to share. Um, so always nice to see. Always nice to see. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me get to our 
our closing comments, I guess. Uh, I know we do have some. <laughs> you should be right in here. Time, uh, gentlemen, please. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, Make up your I, beer. I, I missed my six <laughs> screens. I only got four. I missed, I missed having the six. <laughs> I had all the stuff open and all other screens. I'll, anyway. I'll get a couple over to you. Okay, perfect. Okay, <laughs> first of all, uh, next week's show. And we do like to talk about next week's show now. So uh, next uh, next week's show, the night sky doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, it's like driving in an unfamiliar place. A roadmap is what is your key. So next week, we'll spend some time star hopping around the fall and winter constellations, trying to find our way around a little bit to help you get better acquainted. Next week will be 149 shows. In two weeks' time, or 150th show, we're, we're setting up a little bit of a, a special program for that. So we'll be talking more about that next week. So then in closing tonight, um, we thank you once again for your continued support of our efforts here. Our special thanks uh, always, uh, well, I would have said a special thanks to Rosanna, but she didn't do a talk tonight, but I'm going to say thanks anyway. Thank you. Anyway, anyway, yeah. Thank Happy you, Rosanna. Because <laughs> yeah. you know what, before, before you get into it, Chris, I'm sorry, but uh, oh. I want to say uh, my Thanksgiving uh, besides my family and you guys and, and all my friends, it's for having Rosanna do what she does. So I'm very thankful for what she does for the show. Agreed. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Yeah, very much so. Um, we have a lot to be thankful for, every one of us, I guess, after what we've been through the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, we also hope that all of you who have joined us uh, from Rogers enjoyed the program tonight. If you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can find me here at astronomybythebay.ca. Uh, also, special thanks to all of you who share our program. We really do appreciate it. Remember, too, we do love getting your photos. So send them in to snaz at astronomybythebay.ca or sundaynightastronomyshow at gmail.com. And we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. Now, if you have a suggestion for a topic for a future show, please let us know at the same address. And please let your friends and family know that we'll be back here next Sunday night at the same time, 8 p.m. Atlantic time on YouTube and Facebook to edutain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. Wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. And today, if you celebrate it today, hope your belly's full of turkey. So for now then, from Mike and Paul and I, we wish you a safe and happy uh, few, uh, week, guys. Uh, lots and lots of clear skies. And as we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes pointed up. Yep. Good night, everyone. <laughs>